I'm going to be joined by Steve Waygood, who's the Chief Responsible Investment Officer at Aviva Investors. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to be here. I first joined the industry, if you like, working at WWF, looking at its own investment reserves. We all dreamt then of a future in which finance ministers and central bank governors and the C-suite of every large financial institution in the world would take sustainability issues seriously. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say we've yet got there, but we very, we're very close to. Almost everyone is pretending, at least, to care. Now, that shift is huge. It's mm -hmm. not fast enough, it's not far enough, but it is huge. And if you think about the parabolic curve of change that we've seen, even in the last three years, the last six months, post the US election, it's just been wonderful to behold. I have never had more hope that we can deal with this and that finance can be harnessed to deliver this shift. Stewardship in our industry, people have always pretended to do it, but they've mostly been talking about voting at company AGMs and talking to companies, often behind closed doors in private conversations. Um, I, I think that's great. And we've done that in an abundance for many decades. And we've been quite transparent about it too. You can go on our website and see how your votes, Louise, have been used and all of your team's votes have been used. I think we were the first fund manager in the world 20 years ago to put issues like climate change into our formal AGM voting policy. Um, other issues like ethnic diversity and gender diversity and human rights now are in there too. But climate change, 2001. So that's all about micro stewardship, engaging with companies. Mm -hmm. Macro stewardship, now to come to your question, recognizes that the world's biggest market failure is a lack of sustainability in the markets. We cannot continue economic growth in the way that we have set it up thus far. Um, in fact, if you just look at the climate crisis and every previous panel has referred to that, we are clearly, as James puts it, we are heading towards well, actually a future in which humanity is going to struggle to live by the end of the century, to live within the economy that we're creating. Uh, civilization could begin to collapse at three and a half degrees, 74% of the world's population will not be able to live where they do. Their body won't be able to function. So that, that's a system problem. It's a systemic issue. It's the system rewarding the wrong thing today. If you look at the London Stock Exchange, for example, the implied temperature change is around about three and a half degrees. And that, that is, that's not the one and a half that we're aiming at for Paris or anywhere near it. The world's lungs have collapsed at that level. The rainforests die back. We're, we're a long way past the coral reefs no longer functioning. So the environmental catastrophe that is actually where we're heading, business as usual, that needs system change. Not, not just more disclosure, by the way, and I think disclosure is important, but that just is a better thermometer. We need to turn the heat down in the system. So engaging with individual companies is good, but in, the, in a market that's failing to reward the right action, you need to change the market environment. You need to change the rules of the game. And that clearly isn't the role of banks individually or collectively, or fund managers or insurance companies. It's the role of governments and finance ministers and central bank governors and those that hold the rules of the game, those that write the rules. And they need to change them for the real economy so that every sector has its externalities internalized, as the jargon puts it, make the polluter pay. Or, and rather, and that every sector within banking, insurance and finance investment, that the rules of the game there, as we heard in the previous session, are, re are rethought through a climate lens. And macro stewardship, is us recognizing that a third of our assets are lent to government in the form of sovereign bonds. How do we steward that? If I look at the last 25 years, the change that's happened in the last five is, well, the last two years really, is far greater than the every, the, all previous years combined, no okay. question. We need to continue at that rate and we all need to envision a, a, a system that works very differently. And, and one or two of the panelists have been referring to the financial architecture, changing the architecture and harnessing the system. And I think probably the biggest question we all need to be ask, asking ourselves is how do you harness markets to delivering a smooth and just transition to net zero by 2050? That, that's the biggest question we should be trying to solve for, smooth and just transition. The Paris Agreement is an amazing political vision 
It is a series of political plans, nationally determined contributions, and a process, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and each, each of the conference of parties. Now it's a political vision plan and process. It isn't a financial one. It does have a clause, Article 21C, that talks about aligning finance with the one and a half degree vision. When it was written, they meant aligning overseas development assistance, aligning what still yet hasn't flowed, the 100 billion. And to be really clear, that has to flow soon. But 100 billion once is nowhere near what we need. As yeah. Colin mentioned, it's between two and four trillion a year, every year for the next few decades. So how do we mobilize the nearly 400 trillion in the global capital markets to deliver the Paris Agreement? We need to have a vision for how you mobilize all of finance transition plan for the financial system, not just individual financial businesses. We then need to have a series of, I think, capital raising plans for each country, where each country says how they're going to finance their nationally determined contribution, their Paris plans. And then we need a process that brings all of this together. And the system that exists to do that at the moment, all of it was created post Bretton Woods, post Second World War. It's the international financial architecture. It is not well understood. Um, but I think it needs to be harnessed in order to make sure that we deliver a smooth and just transition. Pockets of it are doing some work, as the previous panel mentioned, mm. the FSB, for example, the Financial Stability Board. But we haven't yet mandated every part of the financial architecture to do everything it possibly can to help manage this crisis on the emergency that it is. Um, very happy to join others that have been declaring that it is a climate crisis is absolutely an emergency and that we need to make sure that every part of the international financial architecture, the regulators, the standard setters, the international organizations that help coordinate the regulation of banks, insurance and finance, the multilateral financial institutions, the multilateral development banks and so on. Mm -hmm. All of these institutions were created by people with vision and with purpose, mostly to promote world peace, actually, through international trade. But the irony now, Louise, is that level of international trade, as it is on a fossil footing, mm. stands the chance of creating a further world war by the end of the century because of the damage that it's going to wreak on countries, people, and civilization. We, and the, the amount of people who will no longer be able to live where they do at the moment, it's, there will be resource wars. That's why the Pentagon and NATO and MI5 and others are beginning to get extremely worried. So we need to change this. And you harness the international financial architecture. That needs the G20 to tell everything within that architecture to change what they're doing and make it, as, make it fit for the challenge of this century. Thank you, Steve.